Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jane Kamensky, the faculty director of the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe. And um, I'm so proud to welcome you to this book talk, um, celebrating and analyzing one of our most important collections. Um, we're, we're just so pleased and honored to be the library entrusted with stewarding the records of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, better known as Our Bodies, Ourselves. The records of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective are an enormous multimedia collection spanning nearly 200 boxes and many more photographs, tapes, interviews, and of course, the many, many editions of those crucial volumes themselves, beginning with the 1971 pamphlet version that promised a course for readers on how to own their own bodies and spanning now decades and generations and spin-offs and translations into more than two dozen languages. Since this collection opened to researchers in 2005, it's been hugely important to Schlesinger Library and to storytellers working on a wide range of topics from social movement history to the radical history of Boston, to gender and health, to organizational behavior and international relations. We're pleased this afternoon to be marking the 50th anniversary of this still vibrant text um, with three figures who have each played different roles um, in, its, uh, in its life course. Um, from Judy Norsigian, one of the co-founders and the longtime executive director uh, of Our Bodies Ourselves, uh, who currently chairs the board of directors. Um, and from Diana Nemumbeja Abwoye, who is a clinician, a nurse practitioner, as well as an expert in public health, especially women's health and global health um, at the Fenway Health Center. Uh, she has a key role in the, uh, in the living legacy of Our Bodies Ourselves. Uh, in 2017, she translated and published OBOS in Luganda for readers in Uganda. And moderating this session will be Wendy Klein, who is the Dima G. Seeley Chair in the History of Medicine at Purdue University. Klein is the author of many books about the tangled history of race, gender, and medicine. Um, her particular role here dates to her 2010 study, Bodies of Knowledge, sexuality, reproduction, and women's health in the second wave, which was one of the first major works based on research in the records of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. She's one of the first scholars um, into those rich, rich boxes. Before I turn the floor over to our speakers, I wanted to take just a moment to thank the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Um, it's your generosity that keeps our programming free and opening to the pub, open to the public, and we thank you. Um, I want also to encourage those of you who are watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature to submit questions at any point during the program, and the speakers will address as many as they can um, in its final stretches. We anticipate a lot of questions, so we ask you to keep them short, um, which will enable uh, Wendy to direct as many as she can um, to the panelists. And now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to our moderator, Professor Wendy Klein. Thank you so much, Jane. It's such a pleasure to be invited to do this, uh, to moderate uh, this fantastic um, uh, presentation panel on our bodies ourselves. Um, and I just wanted to start by sharing uh, a little tidbit. Jane mentioned that uh, the, the, the collection was open to researchers in 2005. Actually, I was one of the lucky ones who got, um, got my fingers in the boxes prior to that when it was still unprocessed. Um, and in fact, um, when I received a Schlesinger Library support grant um, to explore the new acquisition of these papers, uh, I arrived on September 10th of 2001. I was in the reading room in the morning of September 11th, um, a very disturbing day, and I'll never forget the bonding experience I had with two of Schlesinger Library's um, research librarians, Ellen Shea and Sarah Hutchin, who are still 
actively involved at the Schlesinger. Um, it was a day like I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. Wasn't sure how much exposure I'd get to this collection, but I was able to return. Um, it was unprocessed when I first looked at it. And for those of you who've ever worked with unprocessed papers, you'll, you'll appreciate the excitement of opening up a box and having no idea what will be inside. My favorite memory was probably discovering the uh, meeting minutes and notes in the early 70s and all the Googling and I mean the doodling <laughs> and um, artistic work that the Boston Women's Health Book Collective included in their minutes um, was really neat. It was messy, but I knew I'd hit the jackpot. Uh, the papers and the book, capture a pivotal moment in the history of feminism, the history of women's health, and indeed the history of medicine more generally. Uh, the collective was part of a radical revolutionary moment, which I hope we'll hear a little bit more about in the discussion. But also, as we all know, Our Bodies Ourselves is more than just a transformative historical text. It is alive and well, and continues to impact and educate around the globe. How many books, think about it for a second, how many books do you know that continue to be revised, updated, and relevant half a century later? Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, what is it in particular about the content and the message of this particular book that makes it so meaningful? Just keep that in the back of your heads during the next hour. But in terms of questions, let's start with the early years. I'm a historian. We'll start at the beginning and we'll, we'll quickly move uh, forward. Um, but I'm going to turn to Judy Norsegian uh, as, as one of the founders um, to ask a few questions. So um, many women recall the enormous impact of our bodies ourselves. For example, historian Estelle Friedman remembers when her best friend from childhood gave her the book in 1972 or 73. And she recalls that she immediately sat and read through the book and felt a shift in her worldview. And then as she continued, quote, some of my housemates asked what I was reading and there was clearly a sense that it was subversive in some way. So my first question to Judy is, what was so revolutionary about what the Boston Women's Health Book Collective wrote in those early editions? And in what ways was it subversive? Well, I have to admit that I'm not sure there was complete consciousness about how subversive and revolutionary all this material, this material was, all this thinking was. We were speaking about our and, and reflecting upon our own direct experiences with health and medical care, with um, our personal relationships, with a society that had raised us to feel shame about our bodies. We also were dealing with sexism, condescension, and paternalism in most of our healthcare encounters. Most of the OBGYNs at that point, 98% of OBGYNs were men. Most physicians were men, 92%. And the training of physicians was really steeped in sexism and all kinds of crazy ideas about women. I won't begin to give you quotes from textbooks back then. But we were beginning to think about the fact that we were told things that didn't make sense. And we were starting to ask questions for which we didn't have answers. Doctors patted you on the head and didn't want to give you many answers. So we realized we had to educate ourselves. And this body education was the start of much of what we did in our bodies ourselves over the years. We did go to Countway Medical Library at Harvard. We did do some research on our own, but we also gathered together in groups. We shared our experiences. We shared our, our knowledge about our bodies that we had and pointed to areas we needed to know more about. That was revolutionary, revolutionary in that there weren't sources of information and are simply standing up and saying, we need to understand our bodies better. We have a right to this information. Who's gathering it? Where do we go from here? And in the beginning, it was all about demystifying, understanding better. We didn't know at that point just how many drugs were not fully tested for safety and efficacy, how many surgical procedures, particularly those performed on women, were not adequately tested for safety and efficacy. We had a lot to learn as we later married with public health professionals and epidemiologists to learn more about uh, large data sets and what they told us. We didn't even gather the information back then, but over the years, we insisted that it be gathered along with other voices in the field. So it started out really about needing to know this very important information 
really surprised that it wasn't available, it should have been available, and then understanding that there were forces that resisted that engagement with knowledge and becoming better informed, um, challenging the structures that restricted us, that wouldn't let us speak out. And until we really got comfortable with our bodies, understood our bodies better, we couldn't be really effective full participants in society. And that's true for many of the founders of the group. We were involved in some social justice movements, uh, civil rights movement, other movements, but peace movements. But we were, were we fulfilling our abilities? Were we able to completely be there in the center and be leaders in these movements? That wasn't accepted at that point. And I think many of us were beginning to question that. Thank you. So articulate as always, Judy. Um, and I think, Right, just to echo on that, this whole idea of, I mean, your initial expectations were um, simple things like, how do we find a doctor that's respectful? And it was through the process of realizing that to jump those hurdles, you had to do it that yourselves um, that sort of radicalized you further. Um, so say uh, another question for you, Judy, is um, you were all involved in these other groups. Um, you you were uh, politically invested in this cause. Can you say a little bit about what the writing process was like? Um, as a feminist collective, what were some of the challenges that you faced um, trying to um, pr produce such a volume? We have to understand in the beginning, there was not an intention to do a book. We were starting out with community-based courses held in a, a, a place at MIT and a church cultural center, wherever we could find spaces that women could gather. And it was these gatherings that produced rich experiences that we then realized needed to be brought together. We use Olga Stettner machines to mimeograph this material and share it in these community-based settings. And then out of these many groups became a cry to you know, produce a book, bring all this material together. We approached the New England Free Press, which was a movement publisher at that point. They didn't think it was political enough. So we put up the money. I think it was something like $700 to cover the first printing. And it became the bestseller at the New England Free Press over the next couple of years. This newsprint edition really spoke to women in ways that I think some of us didn't expect, some did, but it galvanized and, and, and was part of a larger movement, the second wave of feminism, but also the women's health movement, which was gaining steam across the country. There were the beginnings of women controlled health centers, of self-help groups, women doing um, cervical self exams, women understanding better what was going on with our bodies. And so this was really critical for us to see that we were part of a larger movement. And as we brought these experiences together and tried to weave them in with factual information that we would gather from physicians and nurses who were interested in talking with us and with the material we got at the medical libraries, we realized that we needed to look at each other's um, compilations. We needed to see when an experience was missing. So these um, texts, I should say manuscripts were shared amongst us and with other women and people kept adding to them. So it was an iterative process and it was one that built upon women's experiences. And over time, that was a technique we used in terms of gathering more stories, more information from more women with different backgrounds. You have to understand we were largely a group of white middle-class women at that point in time, some consciousness around race and white supremacy and all those issues that are front and center for us now. But there, was a, there were a lot of blind spots. And I think that was true for many white women in the early stages of second wave, fem, second wave feminism. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. One of the neat things about going through the archives was um, coming across the letters that people wrote you, the readers of the early editions writing in to critique or contribute or share an experience. And you guys took them very seriously. You wrote these people back, you incorporated it into the next edition. Um, so it's fun to see the extent to which that collaboration really existed and how much you as a collective valued that. Um, Last question for you before we kind of move forward. Um, is there anything you want to share about like favorite moments or memories of those early years? Um, and uh, perhaps also reflect on things you might have done differently if you, with hindsight, what might have looked different? Any comments about those experiences? Well, as I look back, I realized there were many times we could have 
been more appreciative of the diff the wide range of experiences that women have and that what we might say about our own experience was not necessarily applicable to someone else. We tried to be respectful of those differences. I don't think we always succeeded. The other thing I want to say about um, this rich beginning is that we began to be in touch with women everywhere. The Wounded Knee Women's Health Collective, um, uh, somebody who was doing the first film about the women's health movement. The uh, Tayer Salou was forming in Puerto Rico. They became one of our closest allies. We were involved in the founding of the National Black Women's Health Project. Many groups uh, of women of color who realized that this women's health movement is important, but we need our own organization. We need to organize and speak for ourselves as women of color, as women from a unique community. And what we did is in the early days, we took royalties income. We never took any of the royalties uh, as personal income. We put it into um, basically the Boston Women's Health Book Collective coffers. And we shared that with groups doing important work in different parts of the country. And then much later, as we'll get to, we started to learn how to support women's groups in other countries. Great, thank you. Um, moving forward a little bit, uh, two major issues that I see that help explain why this book was so influential and continues to be relevant. That question I started out with, right? The, we are half a century in here. So two, um, two issues and two words that I'd like to draw out here. First are accountability and second, accessibility. Words that help explain again why uh, this was such a successful book and movement. Um, and they've been here since the beginning of, the, of, the, of 1971. So let's start with accountability. One of the founding members, Norma Swenson, wrote a memo to the rest of the collective reflecting on the importance of the book. So this was an internal unpublished memo, it's in the archives. And she wrote, quote, we have often said with genuine pride and humility that any woman could have written our book. It just happened to be us. Now, perhaps this is a bit too modest, but here's what she meant and here's how she continued. Terrific as we are, I have a strong need to believe that because it implies that we are accountable to the feelings and experience of that wider world of women out there, that we are simply a filter or reflecting pool for those other women's lives. So Judy, you did talk already about your interest in this acknowledgement that you wanted as white women, you were trying to reach out to a larger, larger group, but if you could just walk us through this process a little bit more, how does a small group of relatively young women take on this accountability? Uh, you were all very aware that you could not possibly represent the experience of all women, but you really took the task to heart. So how did you manage to create a text that reflected this quote, wider world of women out there? Well, as you've already pointed out, Wendy, it started with the letters. Women wrote from all over. We had letters from Alabama and Mississippi from women who had these very thoughts and ideas that they found in the book, but they thought they were alone. They didn't think anybody else thought these things. And some of them thought they were crazy. When they saw that these ideas that they had were in print, um, these were the feminist thoughts they had, you know, I'm a person who should have rights. I'm a person who should be recognized, be a participant in my community. I shouldn't be told to, you know, stay over here in the corner and know my place. Those are the kinds of things that uh, we took to heart. And we saw that women in different parts of the country had very different experiences and we're facing very different challenges. We tried to bring those into the book with each subsequent edition to be responsive to readers. We asked for input, we got input. We, as the women's health movement grew and many groups around the country sprouted out, we reached out to them. We shared some of the documents that we collected from our gleaning of medical literature with many of these groups through something called our women's health information packets. We use royalties income to support the mailing of these packets to groups around the country. We also started a women's health information center that was accessible to both groups and individuals. We wanted to share what we learned, but we also were really cognizant of the fact we had to be responsive to so many women's concerns and their ideas. And there were many women who said, I don't see myself in this book. You're not talking about 
uh, trichotillomania or hair pulling, or you're not talking about the racism I experienced. And although we mentioned racism in the health and medical care system in the very early edition, it was only in subsequent editions that we really dove into with much greater detail problems like sterilization abuse, rampant across this country. And we began to ally with Native American women, with Latinas, um, even with a resident in Los Angeles who helped blow the whistle on sterilization abuse in the largest county hospital there. We were very close to Carasa and Sesa in New York City, and we came very close to Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, who is, of course, um, one of our saints in, and a person to whom we dedicated one of the editions of our book. Uh, she later became president of the American Public Health Association, but she saw early on how so many of these issues had to be tackled and they had to be embraced by women and men everywhere. The only thing I just want to say is that one of the reasons the book really um, struck a chord is that it was never um, anti-male. It was anti-patriarchy, but we reached out to men. We wanted men to understand these issues and we wanted to include men. And what we found out over the years is that many men gave this book to their girlfriends, to their wives, to their daughters, because they saw this information as so liberating and so important to your basic sense of self-esteem ultimately. And that I think is a piece of the story here is the way in which we embrace the participation of men who understood feminism and understood what we were talking about. Exactly, thank you. And, and of course, in ways, the message was not just as much as it is gendered, and this was focused on women's bodies, but the message that individuals have a right to understand what's happening to their bodies, of course, is, is universally acceptable, right? Um, or applicable, I should say. Um, that out of the women's health movement, you have later groups also demanding that they have the right to research and um, um, support their own ideas, make decisions about their bodies. So it was a model that could uh, that could transcend ge gender in some ways, um, I, I just wanna add. Um, and I wanna, we've got nearly 300 people um, watching us right now. And some of these I imagine were not even around. <laughs> we're not born in the 1970s. So I just wanna reiterate messages that uh, Judy has already said before, but how, how unique this was because of the fact that we didn't have access to information. There was no internet back then. Obvious for us older folks, but just good to remind uh, the younger ones that it was just uh, that you couldn't get access to this information in any other medium. You couldn't reach out and sort of identify with others who were experiencing what you were doing until you had uh, this publication. Um, okay. So the other message, uh, the other theme, I said it was accountability and accessibility, uh, overlapping, but I wanna to touch on that as well. Um, and again, I'm gonna quote uh, a founding member, member of the collective to bring us into the question of accessibility, uh, who wrote to the group in 1976 that writing our bodies ourselves was a magical event, um, mostly because Quote, we developed a tool for consciousness raising that has touched the hearts and minds of women all over the world. So if we think of the book as a tool, how has it been effective? And here I wanna move into the global story. And I'd like to invite Diana to reflect on this question of what is it, what tool does this book provide um, that enables groups across the world to really um, draw on this message. So as you heard before, um, Diana translated and published Our Bodies Ourselves into Luganda for readers in Uganda in 2017. So Diana, your experience growing up in Uganda made it clear to you that women and girls were not equipped with basic information about reproductive health. 10 years ago, at the 40th anniversary symposium of Our Bodies Ourselves, you received a copy of the book and it changed your life. So I'd like to invite you to just um, talk about why and how. How did this book change your life and what did you then go and do with it? Well, Wendy, um, I'd like you to imagine, you know, I was a young immigrant woman coming in from, from Uganda and it feels like I'm coming from the history that Judy has just talked about because I was coming right out of what she just described into decades later, you know, after this book had been pub published. I'm talking about a culture where we never discuss sex, sexuality. We never, 
mentioned things pertaining to body parts. You know, at some point, I think while I was in college, because I did my first degree there, we had had like code names for certain body parts that would have secretly have such conversations among us girlfriends or in our dormitories and hostels. But we just never had conversations about these issues. I'm talking about a culture where a man can molest a girl or impregnate a young girl in a village and he gets away with a pat on the back while this girl is being shunned out of society and either being forced to marry or is being expelled from school because she's pregnant. And that's how people's lives kept on changing before our eyes. So when I walked into this country, I mean, I'm talking about a, a, you know, a, a health system where we didn't even have well women visits for women, where you had nothing, no clue about you know, what your life was going through, what body changes you were experiencing. We didn't have the pleasure of, you know, the, the um, opportunity of having such conversations with our parents because, you know, such things were not talked about at all. If you are lucky, you'd have a paternal aunt who would talk to you about sexuality and, and sex and pleasing your husband maybe a couple of weeks before you're getting married. And so that's the culture I came from. And the way I see our bodies ourselves, it's been a book um, you know, a wealth of knowledge passed on from generations from, you know, it's a sign of sisterhood from a, a woman to the next, because to me, having access to this information, I, I got my first copy from Ruth Hubbard, who is also um, an alum of uh, Radcliffe and Denise Bergman, who had edited some chapters of the book in 1998. You know, I just walked up to Ruth one day and asked these questions about pap smears, about tampons, about, you know, things I'd never talked about and they gave me this book. And I knew early on after reading this book that I owed it to generations, my friends, generations of girls in my culture to have access to this material. And that's how I got into translating this, uh, you know, this information. And to me, the way I see it, it was more like a sign of having material readily available for these women um, where they had access to this information, but still felt like they were um, listening to people like themselves. And that's where the idea of adaptations comes in that we've carried on with our bodies ourselves. You know, it's been translated in 30, 33 languages, but we'd like this to be adaptation. So we encourage people to adopt this, um, this, this information. And what this gives is, it's not focusing on altering people's cultures, but it's focusing on equipping women with a tool they can use to advocate themselves. When I did this translation, I depended so much largely on experiences of girls, girlfriends, um, women, and young girls in community to use these experiences and examples. So even the readers of this adaptation would easily relate to the literature and also you know, use it to um, educate themselves. And I still really feel like this, you know, even today, present day, as we do have the pandemic going on, this resource has been very helpful because I've had several reach out to me and ask for access to this resource, figure out how to support different girls and women who are now currently battling with a very high rate of pregnancies and um, God knows what, what's going on um, in different parts of the world because of the closures. But it's that thought of this book has, you know, transitioned from a few women to different chapters, to different editions, to now adaptations over 33, uh, 33 languages of those. And we still hope that many can go on and continue to spread the word and touch the lives of several girls and women. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. A um, couple of things as you were speaking, um, the emphasis on sort of secrecy and silence that you said that um, growing up in your culture, you didn't have access to this information. Um, perhaps a paternal aunt would pull you aside. So many women who wrote early in the 70s about receiving the book in the US would mention that. It was like the best friend they never had, the secret aunt, the, this knowledge that for whatever reason had been um, uh, uh, separated from that, had not they hadn't had access to it, um, and so kind of ending the silence on that is so important. Um, but also, I wanted to think more about what you say about adaptations. Okay, you're one of now 33 different um, um, languages that this book has been adapted into. Can you say a little bit about challenges? What were things that that had to be done really differently because the context was different as you were writing it? 
Yes, so in I'll speak for you know the the, the Luganda adaptation because that's one of the main you know it's the one I um I worked on largely and I've known a little bit about the others. But for me, the very first thing, even you know, just reading the literature, I knew early on that this information was very um, educative, that it was very necessary for my, my culture, but I also knew how culturally different it was for, for my culture. So the challenge for me was to really figure out how to integrate this wealth of knowledge into the culture I come from, but still preserve this culture. Now, I really do appreciate my culture because you know it's been on for generations and largely that's what makes the world diverse. But it's also imperative that we, you know, this information was out there to still foster the relations that women were having among themselves and with their spouses. So I focus largely on uh, looking at this uh, knowledge that was written or the information, and then again, um, incorporating it into the culture. Take for instance, when I wrote about um, our bodies like, uh, and sexuality, and when I wrote about um, birth control, I looked at the literature we had here about birth control, and then I went back and looked at the birth control we had on market. And it felt like we had several in the US, less in Uganda, but then how was I going to structure this chapter of birth control that is available in the US for the women in Uganda and bring this information, but also sort of talk about the resources they have available to them. And then the other, the other thing I struggled with, not just with the translation, but also with the publication was still that concept of not being able to have conversations about certain things. And that concept of um, it's a taboo to talk about some things. So I found largely that some organizations that could have been conduits through which uh, this book would have been distributed to young girls and women decided to not align themselves with um, this book because it was talking about topics that were a taboo in the culture. And then additionally also the, the idea of uh, same-sex couples and you know the rest of the LGBTQ folks who at the point when I actually published this translation, the country was going through back and forth uh, trying to um, have a law that would sort of really completely omit uh, same-sex couples or you know, imprisoned gay people in the country, but I still, at the bottom of my my heart and at the back of my head, I knew such people also deserve the right to know about themselves, know how they could care for themselves, know how to have safe sex within, you know, their own sexual preferences. And so I decided to incorporate this information in the book, but sort of imploring the slangs that had gone on from my generation going forward to sort of have them get access to this information. No, I'm writing for their audience, but still be mindful of what was going on politically in the country. So essentially I sort of felt like it's not that one experience, one uh, text fits all, but we just have to tailor it to um, different denominations. Absolutely, I'm feeling exhausted just listening to you describe what you, what you had to do in order to um get material in there. Um, and that raises, again, that issue of accessibility, um, the challenge when uh, some of the issues are, are going to be silenced by groups because of taboo subjects. And how do you, you know, how do you um, dance around that, that line or that slippery slope where you can reach uh, the largest number of readers or listeners um, and still uh, maintain uh, those connections, not losing those connections. Thank you so much. We, did, we have a little bit of time left before we open it up to the audience. So I'd like to ask actually both, um, and, and still focusing on this very important global issue, um, I'd like to hear from both Diana and Judy about what you think today. So we've sort of moved from the beginning over into the shifted into as it, um, the book went global. Um, now let's talk about the future. What do the two of you think are the most vital global issues that the, the book addresses um, and that you'd like to see moving forward. Um, and then along those lines, if you had the ability to send one message to all women around the globe, what might it be? If you think that's a fair question and how might you get the message across? Um, Judy, do you wanna? 
Well, um, I think that the whole global women's health movement has had a very special focus on reproductive justice and what it means, mm -hmm. whether in, it's in terms of global warming or all the issues before us. And as um, Diana and I would say, if we had more time, there's a wonderful story emerging from Brazil where they're just completing a three volume edition. The first one is about to come out, a complete adaptation for a Brazilian audience, but also Portuguese speaking women elsewhere around the world. They are thinking about all of these issues, violence against women in particular, and how it uniquely plays out in different cultures. Uh, the question of access to abortion, contraception, um, treatment for sexually transmissible um, infections. The women who have been uh, like Diana, and we're so fortunate to have Diana on the board of Our Bodies Ourselves, because she's an amazing woman. These women have endured all kinds of attacks, undermining the family, um, you know, going against the grain of society. The OBGYN in Armenia, who was the coordinator, was accused in the paper of committing yet another genocide against Armenians because she was promoting um, access to contraceptives and information that would prevent sexually transmissible infections. By the way, that's one of the major causes of infertility in that country historically. So you are a very brave person taking on this work. And we have so many other examples of women taking the book, recognizing they need something like it in their own country. We never asked anyone to produce a translation adaptation. We would be the last people to know how to even uh, approach that. But women in different countries had ideas about what needed to change, how the text needed to be more adapted to be more useful. But along the way, each one of them endured all kinds of attacks, some of them physical, mostly they were verbal. And that's something we should not forget when you're talking about sexuality, about access to abortion, about women being full human beings, you are challenging a power structure that isn't going to be happy about women coming to the fore and demanding a different kind of treatment. I, I just wanted to mention that um, before we go any further, and I'm sure Diana has more things to say. Well, I, when I think about the global problems to me, I look at mainly the um, maternal health, maternal death, deaths, including those due to abortions, due to unwanted pregnancies. And I think recently the, the UNICEF sort of uh, gave a random number of 211 deaths for 100,000 live births for women um, due to childbirth. And then I look at unwanted pregnancies and I look at uh, problems like uh, infections like Judy just talked about. And you know, when you come from a different part of the world where they don't have as much access to healthcare like we do in this country, these problems are huge, 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 huge. And so it's very important for such literature to be out there, not just to, as not, not just as a, a feminist, you know, feeling that I have deep inside, but just because I care deeply to have this information out there to sort of prevent such problems from going on. Let's talk about the pandemics. I'll speak about for Uganda. Right now, schools have been closed for almost two years. In, in the rural part of the country, they don't have access to the internet. And what that means is, is to, these girls haven't had classes for all this long. What's happening? Lots of child abuse, reps, um, molestations, the, the rates of pregnancies are way up there. And there's been so many women reaching out, asking how we could deal with it, asking how we can help. Now, what I think, sending out such information, such literature, such uh, support to these women would not alter what has been done, but would collectively help us uh, deal with such problems and what would come out of you know these pregnancies because we're going to have teenage mothers and truthfully i imagine a world where we where all our voices were heard collectively you know um, a world where you know from my culture we have this thing that translates into char char charity begins at home so i'd call upon every single woman to sort of know themselves know their body be an advocate for themselves. And then after doing so, pass on this information from one generation to the next, 
And together, maybe we could change the trajectory of women's health and um, treatment of women all over the globe. And I like the idea of the internet now, which sort of democratizes things, you know, thanks to globalization in a way, at least in this regard, that we can still have access to this information through the internet and then disseminate it that way. The other thing I just want to add is that literacy is still a huge problem for many girls and women across the globe. We've had some fascinating stories about how this book has been used as a literacy tool in Spanish and in other languages. And in fact, there were a group of uh, Afghan women who some years back uh, translated sections of the book and used it as a literacy tool in Afghanistan. I can see right now that maybe we're going to have to be resorting to underground publications and, you know, home schools. Uh, who knows what's going to happen for women in Afghanistan around education. But the books are out there, books like Our Bodies, Ourselves. They will be tools that will, I think, fire up a revolution wherever it's needed, wherever women are going to be oppressed, whether it's because of domestic or cultural or institutional state-sponsored violence or um, simply just neglect. I think a lot of the maternal mortality that Diana just referred to really has more to do with um, profound neglect. Lots of these deaths are totally preventable, as we know. And speaking up about these issues and making sure that uh, donor countries, that institutions that fund um, projects that supposedly address these problems will do a better job at it. Um, we, we know that there are such efforts globally. We have the um, you know, recent global meeting um, that is bringing together women's groups from all over the world to look at these among other issues. So I think there is hope. COVID has made it much harder to do a lot of what we need to do, but we're still gonna all persevere. And the groups around the world who have produced translation adaptations of Our Bodies, Ourselves have written short descriptions of their work. Some of this is at our website. Uh, their stories are amazing. I, I think that for us, some of us, I put myself in that category, we never imagined that it would be in so many countries and making such a difference, but still it's a drop in the bucket because the publications are small in number relative to the number of women who live in these countries. The access to information that's good on the internet is limited. Lots of junk out there on the internet and many young women and men are reading um, materials that are simply false, not true. And counteracting that is very difficult. How do you get to be, you know, top on the list of something someone will read on the internet? Uh, if somebody uses a search engine, probably it's some advertiser who's paid to have their material to uh, come up first. It's not going to be necessarily material like an Our Bodies, Ourselves adaptation would offer. Absolutely. We have lost something, you know, we've gained a lot with technology, but a lot has been lost as well. In, in the process. Thank you to the two of you for putting up with my questions. Um, we have um, time now for some questions. We already have several popped up, but um, we're, we're gonna spend the rest of our short time together um, taking questions from the audience. If you have a question for our speakers, please submit it use, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Keep your question concise. We'd like to get to as many as we can at the time we have. Um, so I'm gonna start, I have a question here for Diana. Um, and I'll just read it to you, Diana. Do you think your experience with adapting our bodies ourselves to Luganda can help us try to educate people, particularly women, about alternatives to their traditional ways of thinking about issues of leadership and threats like global warming? Well, if I've learned a thing or two, I've learned that everything is possible. I'd like to say coming from my background that for the most part, largely, uh, people don't like to erase their cultures. I mean, it would be offensive to even think to do so. But I think we could look at the positives within their cultures and build on that to get the changes we'd like to see. When it comes to leadership, for instance, um, I still think from my experience through this adaptation, having worked through it, having appealed to many, I've had several women come up to me and say, 
I wish I had such a resource growing up. And these are very older, uh, respectable women in, in our society. And you know what I've told them is, yes, you didn't have this, uh, this resource growing up, but we could collectively share these resources to the young, with the young generation. Can you work with me and share this with uh, you know, the young girls and the generations to come? And they're willing to do so. Now that said, maybe a similar approach could be used to change issues around leadership. Maybe a similar leadership could be used to educate some men in different cultures to understand that you know, everyone has, has a right to an equal seat at the table. And when it comes to global warming, I think what I must say, which is really sort of very empowering is, you know, or maybe overly um, ambitious is that women can solve most of the problems in the world. So if we entrust them with you know, climate change and global warming, why not? It could be something that could be done, definitely. Thank you. Um, question for Judy is actually, is, there are several questions coming in about um, the archival process. Um, so, one question is whether or not the collective had a sense from the very beginning, so this is for Judy, um, that they were creating history. Was there a recognition already from the start that this was material that should end up in an archive? So that's one part. And then other questions involve, are things still being archived? Are, the, uh, the, uh, are we expanding the archives with these new translations? Judy, to the best of your knowledge, is um, Diana's material, for example, entering into the archive. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that? Well, I will say in the very beginning, I think some women in the group thought this is going to go a long distance. They were um, sure that it, it had profound meaning. I'm not sure every one of us did, but we uh, didn't know in the beginning that we were going to be storing our materials at Schlesinger <laughs> or any other place. What we did know is that we had to save everything. And our houses were filled with boxes. We wanted to keep good records. Um, some of it is because we're a nonprofit organization, but some of it is, you, you know, we just want to be able to go back and read a letter or learn from something you did before. We didn't throw out very many things. When we did make the decision, and this is in part because we had so much stuff in our homes, we had to find a place, a good place for all of it. When we decided that, yes, this would be a great place, and I actually am a little bit um, weak on the original conversations with Radcliffe, though I probably was involved with them. I cannot remember who reached out first. Did we reach out to Schlesinger or did they reach out to us? And I think it was the latter. But then we realized this is a perfect place for all of these documents, the minutes, the materials, the books. And so we started collecting them all. And most recently, I was in the home of Paula Duress Waters, who moved out to California to be with her daughter a couple months ago. And I was going through her dozens of boxes that she had not yet sent over to Schlesinger and packing them up and getting them ready. And um, they're all there now. And very excited to see, um, yes, there's some duplicative material, but some that wasn't duplicative. And all of this is still going over there. Most of us have transferred our files. New editions, the Lugandan edition is there. I um, would encourage Diana, if she has personal files at some point, to share them. Uh, we, we do worry about um, protecting some of the women who were doing this work in riskier contexts. And so a few things have been held back or they have not been um, given to be shared right away, but ultimately all this information will be accessible. And it is an amazing story when you think about the life of a book, which isn't just a book, it is um, been used by groups in many countries to create projects, whether it's to deal with violence against women or it's to deal with maternal mortality. The book has been a tool, not just to educate individual women, but to get groups of women and organizations to think about how to change public policies. How do we change the policies that affect our lives so that we're not oppressed by them the way we are now? And that to me is how the book is a living tool and how people like Diana have created not just a book, but um, a movement or a way to go forward to change the circumstances 
of women and girls' lives. And now as we try to use more gender inclusive language, we're gonna be better at um, describing the wide array of um, experiences that people of different genders have in the world today. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's very powerful and it's so important. Um, and I, uh, I just wanna add very quickly, I know this is the Q&A, but um, the importance of personal stories, because I'm reading the Q&A and, and actually what a lot of people are doing are sharing more personal stories. That one of the powers of, of this book that, that is part of the theoretical tool is the, the use of stories, of experiential evidence, um, rather than purely medical based um, knowledge to really illustrate how individual women are, are are encountering are experiencing their health issues. So I just wanted to add that. And also because we won't be able to read through all these questions, but uh, you'll appreciate um, the, um, the stories that people are sharing and the passion. This is an audience that cares very much about what both of you, J Judy and Diana are doing. Along those lines, um, Diana, there is a plea. Um, someone has written in, and I'm sure others feel this way. Um, what can people do to help your efforts? Can you um, steer them somewhere? Or is there a link or an organization or something that um, people should know about if they want to help in Uganda? At this point, while I so this translation was done, and I personally did do the traveling through the country and um, worked with small women's groups versus larger organizations for political reasons. Um, at this point, there's a small movement, a small organization of women who are working and continuing to distribute this material. There is a group that has reached out and they would like to adopt this book into a language spoken in the Northern part of the country. Now, largely for myself, I don't speak, you know, the language is up north because there's so many dialects in the country. And so this, these women are in the preliminary stages of adopting this information to make sure it's also shared among us, the part of the country that was sort of shut off from the world because of uh, the civil war that went on for that long. I'd say if someone would like to be helpful towards this um, effort, you could go through, I still do, I still, I do serve on the board of our bodies ourselves. And for very many such projects, we could talk about this through the board or through myself, who is also seen as the global partner of the organization to that part of the world. And then I could direct you to different organizations that would be very um, receptive of the efforts versus uh, those that would, wouldn't want to be aligned with um, this content. Great, thank you so much. A uh, quick question, um, I, I know we're getting close on time. Um, several questions about information in various editions, but let's just summarize it by, uh, Judy, if you could just take a minute to talk about the, uh, the changes in the content of the book itself. We know that it started in this news print uh, version, it was about 100 or 150 pages. It moves up to over 800 pages. Um, I often, for my students, assign as a research paper, compare one theme over various editions. How does it change? But if you could just say briefly, how has the content changed? What content, what topics or concerns were emphasized later versus earlier? Well, very early on, there was a chapter about rape. That was violence against women. Over time, that chapter called violence against women took on all kinds of forms that women, um, in, in all kinds of ways that women experience violence, whether it's sexual harassment in the workplace, whether it's domestic violence. And so that expanded. We also did not have a chapter about menopause in the very first book. Well, obviously um, menopause is part of our lives. So over the years, we've expanded that material. We've also partnered with women who are very concerned with the nomenclature. We now understand that, you know, the menopause is not this magic moment. There is something we refer to as the perimenopause and that women very early on, even before their periods begin to stop or get irregular, can have what we call perimenopausal um, symptoms or experiences and we need to understand these better. So we've partnered with a wonderful um, group. It's actually a, a woman who's created a website called Women Living Better 
www.artsandcrafts.org. And she's worked with many of our partners who've contributed to the book to produce this kind of information and have it updated on a regular basis. We're also partnering with Suffolk University where they've started a wonderful project called Our Bodies Ourselves Today. This is a digital project where information will get updated and be made available in different formats. Um, this is a wonderful way in which the material has sort of morphed over the years and will stay current. We didn't have anything about women in the environment in the very first editions. We expanded that material and we had a growing chapter on the environment and women's health. We had addressed more of the, what I would say, non-reproductive health issues in some of the editions up until 2004. And then we decided that the book was getting so big, we had to focus in on, on sexual and reproductive health issues across the lifespan. So we took out material, some of the material about heart health. We kept in material about diabetes in pregnancy, but we took out some of the general material. And then we did incorporate um, information about gynecological issues that we may not have had much about in earlier editions, uh, vulvovaginal problems. And we're now partnering with a a physician and a nurse midwife to um, host a fabulous website that really gets into the intricacies of dealing with uh, vulvovaginal problems, which are not easily diagnosed and treat treated even to this day. So there are many examples like that where we took on an issue because somebody said, hey, you've left this out. We got some information. We had more extensive information about endometriosis in some of the later editions because of the Endometriosis Association and its close work with us. Groups like that approached us. We brought in the information. Some of it is um, a little out of date. The last edition, print edition was 2011. But what we did then was try to maintain in the book the material that was least likely to go out of print or out of, um, that would be least likely to um, be out of date and not be relevant and to lead to websites for more updated information. The fact that we aren't planning to do another print edition at this moment means that the Suffolk project is so important because they will be updating information in a digital format going forward. Uh, it's, you know, the possibilities, um, I mean, there are many more things to say about this, but I think one could create a very different kind of our bodies ourselves now. Uh, people have had projects based upon this format, um, um, Trans Bodies, Trans Cells, which was a project produced out of Philadelphia that was one of the first such books to deal with um, transsexual issues and um, to bring in many of the issues that we could only touch upon in the sexuality chapter. That's an incredible book, which I hope will get updated. It's now somewhat dated itself. But these projects that have emerged reflect this kind of um, marriage of feelings, experiences, factual information, and a lack of judgment. Don't tell people what to do. Give people the valuable information they need, and then they'll make the decisions for themselves that best meet their personal, political, and social situations. Thank you. Brilliant, as always. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there are lots of other questions we didn't get a chance to, to get to, but I want to um, thank Diana and Judy um, and give you a moment to sort of say thank you and wave before I do my concluding remarks. Thank you to you, to you both for your, um, your inspiration and your drive and your passion and your commitment. Um, so this concludes our program today. I wanna thank Diana and Judy for their thoughtful perspectives and our audience for their terrific questions. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. For information on upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs, to see videos of past events, and to explore the online collections at the Sussinger Library, please visit www.radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care. Bye.